Awesome. Well, thank you, Trent, and thank you, Autumn. So I am Haley Prinz. Um, as they said, I have had the privilege of serving at Lifeline for four years now. I have this awesome group of junior girls here in the front. Um, I'm also married to Chris Prinz in the back there, and he's been serving at Lifeline for five years now and has a group of sophomore guys. Um, and we have really, really, truly loved serving here. In fact, before we had even met, we both felt called to this age group. Um, so this is something really special for us. I've also, the last couple years, I've had a lot of things that the Lord has been putting on my heart that I've been keeping in my phone just in case I ever had the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, so this is a collection of a lot of that stuff. Um, we are going to be going through a lot of scripture tonight, and some of it is going to be up on the screen here for you, um, but some of it I'm just going to verbalize. But for some of you note takers, um, and if you want to dive in more, all of that scripture is going to be listed at the end. Um, so I would like to start off with a story. Um, anyone heard of the guy Morgan Spurlock or seen his uh, documentary Super Size Me? Yeah? Okay. So in 2004, Morgan did an experiment which involved him eating nothing but McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 30 days. Uh, so this documentary follows his journey and it shows the physical and the psychological health and well-being of Morgan while also exposing the fast food industry's corporate influence and how it tries to uh, encourage poor nutrition for profit. At the end of the 30 days, Morgan gained 24 and a half pounds gained 13% body mass increase, had mood swings, and fat accumulation in his liver. It took him nearly 14 months to lose the weight that he had gained in this experiment. Now, I know that this is extreme, but it's an extreme example of how much what we feed ourselves can affect us. Now, is McDonald's wrong to have on occasion? No. Not necessarily, but in excess, it could have a major effect on our health and our well-being. So what I'm trying to say is what we feed ourselves matters. It can give us life or take it. So think about this in your own life. What are you feeding your mind? What are you feeding your soul? Are you being intentional about what you watch, what you listen to? what you read, who you spend your time with, and who you talk to. The evil one will try to suppress the Lord's voice through the world. This is a slow process that sneaks up like a thief in the night. And over time, the Lord's voice will become harder and harder to hear. This is why what we feed ourselves is so important. This is why we have to be intentional. The way you talk, the way you act, and the way you think directly reflects what you're feeding yourself. I'm going to be honest, guys. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was very, very convicted myself. The Lord didn't only put this on my heart to transform you, but it is definitely transforming me too. So uh, let's pray before we dive in. Lord, I pray that anything that is not from you or rooted in your truth would be forgotten tonight. And I pray your words would be marked on the hearts of everyone here, that they would internalize what they hear from you tonight and allow it to transform their heart. Lord, help us be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, the evil one will try to suppress the Lord's voice through the world. Here's what we are told about being a friend of the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, desires of the flesh and desire, desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. So did you guys catch that? The world is passing away along with its desires. Anything the world can offer you is temporary satisfaction. It is not eternal. 
The evil one rules the world, but we are from a God who rules eternity. And our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Luke 9.25 says, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses and forfeits himself? And that's really what we have to remember. In order to resist the temptations of the world, one must sacrifice their earthly desires and suffer for the sake of the gospel. Now, I know that doesn't sound like something everybody would run to line up and sign up for, but trust that the Lord will satisfy you. There is greater pleasure in Christ than in the world. There is greater pleasure in Christ than in the world. How do you feel about that? Do you believe it? Maybe some days you believe it more than others. Well, let me give you a major truth bomb. Your feelings don't determine God's love for you. God exists outside of our emotions. Think about that. The way we feel about him does not determine who he is. The world will try to convince you that he is not a loving God, and regardless of how you may feel, he could not love you any more or any less than he does right now. The weight of the world is heavy, and it is impossible to please. But the Lord says that he is well pleased. In fact, in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how do we become fully satisfied in Christ? How do we how do we get more of him? Well, it starts with being intentional. Are you intentional about what you watch? So how many hours a day or week are you watching Netflix or reality TV, YouTube, porn, TikToks? What you spend the majority of your time watching will shape you. Now, the platforms I just listed are rooted in the world, And they will influence your thoughts and poison truth. Now, is every show on Netflix evil? No. Is reality TV show sometimes super entertaining to watch? Sure. But we must remember that your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Luke eleven thirty four through 36. We need to make sure that we're shining our light, not letting the evil one tempt us into hiding it. What you watch has the full ability to shape your views, desires, and motivations. Now, unfortunately, we live in a world that has provocative and secular images and clips around every corner. The commercials played, the billboards on the side of the road, the ads that come up online, even programs meant for children have crossed way too many lines. It is much harder today than it was even 10 years ago to guard our eyes. This is no small task. So something that I began praying for is for the Lord to help me take captive any thought that is not from him and make it obedient to Christ. I pray that he would help me think of things that are pure, excellent, and worthy of praise. I pray for protection over my eyes to keep me lusting after the temporary pleasures of this world. So pay attention to what you spend your time watching. Does it have the potential to pull you deeper and deeper into the world and farther away from God? Are you intentional about what you listen to? What are your go-to podcasts, guys? What celebrities and influencers have your ear? What kind of music are you listening to in your (laughs) day-to-day? So when we become familiar with the lies of the world, it becomes harder and harder not to believe them. There are a lot of ways to get their, for people to get their opinions heard, and we have access to so much information, it can become incredibly complex to discern what is truth. So much like we must guard our eyes, we must guard our ears. 
My faith was actually transformed by what I chose to listen to. So when I was 22, I moved over to the east side of the state to start a job in pharmaceutical sales. And there was a lot of driving involved with this job. So I had all kinds of time to listen to books on tape, podcasts, and music. It kind of took me a while to find a church home my first year living out there. I was out there on my own. And so during that time, a friend of mine had recommended a podcast called The Porch. So this podcast consisted of uh, sermons from a young adults ministry that was down in Texas. And this was the first time that I had ever heard the gospel preached in a way that made so much sense. I grew up in a traditional Methodist church, and while I knew the stories of the Bible and I had grown up with faith, I had never heard the gospel preached about topics that hit so close to home. They preached on everything that young adults go through, things like anxiety, dating, money, success, you name it. And after a couple of months, I realized I was listening to multiple sermons a day. I truly just couldn't get enough. And I felt close to the world, or close to the Lord in a whole new way. In fact, there was one time I was driving to a meeting and the Lord's presence was so overwhelming. I had to pull over just to kind of contain myself. I ended up driving home right then. And when I got there, I fell to my knees and rededicated my life to Jesus right then. And it wasn't shortly after that that I actually found a church home over there that had a young adult's ministry very similar to the one that I had been listening to on the podcast. So I am very confident that I would not be where I am today without that podcast. And I thank God all the time for getting a hold of my heart through the porch. So what you listen to matters, you guys. It has the power to suppress the Lord's voice or amplify it. Are you being intentional about what you read? What kinds of things are we reading on a daily basis? Social media posts, probably? The news? Comments people post about you? (laughs) Comic books? Gossip articles? How much more are you reading those things than the Bible? The more we spend time reading things on social media especially, the more we begin to compare ourselves. Comparison is the thief of joy. I'm going to say that again. Comparison is the thief of joy. 2 Corinthians 10.12 says, But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Don't you know that you were created in the image of God? That he made you perfectly to fulfill his will. How will you ever fulfill the plan the Lord has for you if you're constantly comparing your plan to someone else's? I mean... How often does a social media post influence your entire mood? I'm going to be honest, this happens to me way more often than I would like to admit. My day could be going great, and all of a sudden I pull up Instagram, and first thing I see is a picture of a friend on vacation, laying by the pool in a swimsuit. And this causes a million thoughts to go through my mind, like, man, that looks nice. I wish I was somewhere warm. And gosh, she looks really good in that swimsuit. I wonder if she works out. I really got to work out. And I don't know if I've ever looked that good in a swimsuit. And then, boom, I am thinking all of these negative thoughts that could potentially negatively affect my mood and affect how I proceed with my day. Seconds before I opened that app, I was fine. I know that these feelings can be really hard to control, which is why the amount of time that we spend on social media is so important. Now, I know that there can be very encouraging things on social media rooted in truth, but don't be naive to the hold that it may have on you. So something that helps with this is prioritizing time in the Word. Uh, Chris and I like to spend the first 30 minutes or so of our day uh, reading the Bible. This is something uh, we refer to as chair time, like a lot of people at Ada do. And we do this separately, but oftentimes um, we will discuss kind of what we read through as we get ready that morning. And I notice the days that I don't do my chair time, I feel really off. And I've shared this with my girls before, but Chris and I aren't the best at continuing chair time while we're on vacation. And we notice about halfway through that trip that we just feel irritable, more short-tempered, and just off balance. I feel like we really need that daily bread, you guys. 
And so feeding yourself the word, you have to know, is absolutely essential to a relationship with Jesus. How can we grow in our relationship with him if we don't know him? So something I'd like to share that I heard recently was, so people that work for the Treasury of the United States uh, that are supposed to try to point out counterfeit money, so to study counterfeit money, they never literally like look at all different types or think, oh, hey, here's this new counterfeit money that's on the market. Like, let's get familiar with it. So they don't do that. They study the real currency so much that when a fake bill comes across their hand, they know something's wrong. Maybe they doesn't, it doesn't quite look right. It doesn't like reflect right. It doesn't quite weigh the right amount. They don't know what's wrong necessarily because they haven't studied what's wrong. But they are so familiar with the real thing that they know something is wrong. And this is how we have to think of God's word. We need to be so familiar with truth, which is the word of God, that a second a lie or falsehood comes across our plate, it's like, whoa, hey, I don't know why that's a lie, okay? But I I know that it is because I know the real thing so well. God gave us the incredible gift of his word all in one place. We are so blessed to have access to the Bible, guys. There are literally countries that would put you in jail for reading the Bible. Think about that. Next, I want to ask, are you being intentional about who you spend your time with? Friends, peers, colleagues, family? Who you spend the most time with will influence you. Have you ever started a new friendship with somebody and pretty quickly after hanging out, you start saying the same phrases or start finishing each other's sentences? Well, this often happens a lot quicker than we realize. And whether it's good or bad, we quickly adjust our whole vibe to match who we are spending our time with. So think about that. Are you spending time with people that lift you up, support you, encourage you, pray for you, and treat you with respect? Do you have people in your life that love you enough to hold you accountable? Or do they pressure you into saying, doing, and thinking things that make you uncomfortable? Throughout Scripture, we see Jesus being friends with outcasts, prostitutes, Pharisees, etc., which it's important to show love and kindness to everyone, but not everyone should be your best friend. In Acts, we read about Paul when he was preaching in Ephesus, and it says, And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew them, and he took his disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. Acts 19, 8 through 9. They separated themselves from toxic people. And we are also told in Romans, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Romans 16, 17 through 18. You have to guard your heart. Pray for discernment on good and evil. Be wise as to know what is good and innocent and as to what is evil. Who you spend your time with matters. Now I want to ask, are you being intentional about who you talk to? I can't tell you how many times I go to Chris or my friends or family and I start to talk through a situation or vent about needing answers and all of a sudden I realize I have not even talked to God about this yet. How can we expect all of these answers from God when we haven't even had a conversation with him? Don't get me wrong, the Lord uses people in your life to speak to you through the Holy Spirit, but it's easy to find ourselves frustrated with God about something that we have not even prayed to him about yet. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So that's pretty cool, right? The Lord's telling us just to ask. Doesn't seem so hard, right? But what we also have to remember is that our life is to fulfill his will, not our own. So you might not get the answer that you were looking for. 
But we are told in Romans 12, 12 to rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. The more we communicate with him, the closer we will be and the more we can trust him. Think about the person that you're closest with in your life. Maybe that's your mom, your best friend, a cousin, your brother. How often do you talk to this person a day or in a week? What if all of a sudden you just only talk to them like once a month, like once every few months? What would that do to the relationship? Are you being intentional about who you talk to? Now, I know we talked through a lot of different things that we could be feeding ourselves, and not all of these things are necessarily bad things, but even good things can distract us from God. If the devil can't make you bad, he will make you busy. I'm also aware of the amount of shame that some of you might be feeling. And something that I remind my girls about all the time is that shame is from the devil. Conviction is from the Lord. Shame is, I'm going to pay for that. Conviction is, I have so much to lose. Jesus has already paid for your past, present, and future sins. So lean into that conviction and allow it to transform you to be more like Jesus. So in order to resist the temptations of the world, one must sacrifice their earthly desires and suffer for the sake of the gospel. This is made very clear in Scripture. 1 Peter 4 says, To suffer for the sake of the gospel is to be a good steward of God's grace. But our suffering has purpose, you guys. In Romans 8, 17, it reminds us that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Jesus knew that we weren't capable of saving ourselves. So he stepped in when we didn't deserve it. When we were filthy in our sin and rejecting him, he chose us, us over himself. He could have saved himself from that cross, but he resisted. In fact, he was mocked, ridiculed, and tempted to save himself, but he didn't. He would never ask anything of you that he hasn't already done for you. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you might be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will always provide a way out. It might be hard and difficult. That's why words like endure are used in that scripture. But remember, you aren't doing this alone. Hebrews 2.18 says, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And I think oftentimes we forget that, that Jesus was also tempted, and he lived a sinless life. So temptation alone is not a sin. It's the giving into temptation that becomes sinful. I can't even fathom the amount of pain and suffering that Jesus endured for us. This was the greatest act of love in human history, you guys. Jesus obeyed the Father for our benefit. So even in our weakest and our darkest moments, we are called to trust the Lord, just as Jesus did when he was suffering on that cross, paying for our sins. So you don't decide to follow Jesus just out of shameful guilt or, oh, because you were told to. You choose to follow him out of undeniable love for God. You obey him because you love him. The more you love him, the more you will want to please and serve him. To be conformed to a pattern of religion is not the same as being transformed by the Holy Spirit of God. We exist to glorify him, and we were created in his image to be obedient servants to him. So how do we even repent, and what is repentance? Well, it starts with praying, Holy Spirit, would you help change my mind and my heart to be more like you? For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death, 2 Corinthians 7.10. We must remember to also forgive ourselves 
the way that the Lord has forgiven us. If you're struggling forgiving yourself about something, you're holding yourself to a higher standard than God. Think about that. Align your heart with God and ask for things that glorify him. So how do we possibly follow Christ and not be a friend of the world? Well, it's a hard truth, but they persecuted Jesus, so they'll persecute you. But fear not. You have the whole armor of God. This is a superpower given to us by the Holy Spirit. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Ephesians six fourteen through 20. I think it's oftentimes easy to forget the power in the Holy Spirit. It's the same power that healed the blind, you guys. He can heal your problems. As long as we are in the flesh, we will always feel at war with our sin. Sanctification happens daily, and some days are going to be easier than others. But fear not. He has overcome the world. Peace and contentment can only be found in Christ. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with my weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. We fall short, and we always will. That's why we need Jesus, guys. He's our lifeline. (laughs) Don't let sin change you. Let salvation change you. If you find yourself in a dark place, evaluate. What are you feeding yourself? You can't out-sin the cross. And regardless of what your story is or what it will be, God will be glorified through it. So let's pray. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us love others the way that you love us. Give us a lens that allows us to see the world the way that you do. Help us be intentional about what we watch, what we listen to, what we read, who we spend time with, and who we talk to. Bring to light our sin and give us and guide us to repentance. For we know your way is better than our own. And we pray to be filled with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And remind us that you dwell within us. That we have the whole armor of God. Lord, we devote every part of us to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.